Hello everyone and welcome to The Public Space. We continue our digging through the rope hypothesis of Bill Gates. Will the rope hypothesis sustain the highest levels possible of gravity, the black hole? This is what we will determine in this episode titled Lassoing Black Holes. Bill Gates, how are you doing today? I'm doing fine, uh, JFG. All right, and joining us also is Peter, who has been challenging uh, the theory last time. How are you doing, Peter? Excellent, JF. I hope all is well. All right, guys, it is my privilege as a host to start with my own pet obsessions. Today, uh, as I was thinking about this episode, I started dunking photons in black holes just for fun, <laughs> just shooting, shooting photons at a black hole. Gentlemen, give, give me, give me an idea of whether that is a good thing to research. I've been looking at this basketball ring and you know how sometimes we, we, we throw a ball and it doesn't quite enter into it and it swings and it bounces. It, it rolls around the ring. Now it, it wants to enter, but it, it bounces out. It comes back in. Now here's the thing. I've been shooting photons at a black hole. And the same effect happens. If I shoot a photon here and it's of the correct wavelength, just the correct wavelength to be as big as the, the little circle here of the black hole, we get bouncing photons, don't we? And from well, that, fr from that thinking, not only do I predict that some photons can pop out of a black hole randomly, I predict a prismatic effect whereby the more you get deep into the photon, the more the smaller wavelengths will be bouncing. And therefore, as you dive toward a black hole, I predict a separation of the colors of light such that as you enter it, it's all blue. And then when you're in, it's all red. Peter, what do you think? Wow. Okay. So this is very interesting. Uh, you're competing here with Stephen Hawking, actually. So uh, I guess you're in good company. Although Bill Gates, uh, uh, in the, uh, probably is not too happy with that, I suppose. But uh, yeah, it's interesting. I don't. I don't have. I had to. I would have to unpack that and uh, chew on it for a bit. Who knew that basketball would one day resolve the conflict between uh, relativity <laughs> and quantum physics? <laughs> All right, so let's start with our subjects of today. Those were, were my little min minderings of the day as I was eating foie gras with my girlfriend and just shooting photons <laughs> on my piece of paper. Bill Gates, let's talk about the challenge that gravity poses at very high level to the rope theory of physics. Can you introduce us? Have you been thinking about it? And what is your take on how the ropes interact at the black hole level? Well, we, I start at a different level altogether. I'm saying there's no such thing as a black hole. Black hole is a fantasy. It should be taken completely out of, it's not, it doesn't belong to physics. It doesn't belong to science. It belongs to religion 150%. The problem with the black hole, that's where we start. Problem with the black hole is that we have no idea. The, there's no mathematician on earth who can tell us what they mean when they say black hole. Black hole is taken to be on one hand, an object, and on the other one, an abstract mathematical concept. And uh, if you look at that, uh, the first one, O2 black hole object that I sent you there. Uh, no, the, the, yeah, that one there. NASA says that, it's, that a black hole is a great amount of matter packed into a very small area. It's a sphere, they talk about tiny, they talk about small. They're referring to a little bowling ball, a black bowling ball or a black eight ball. That's what they're talking about. Now, if you look at the next one, the O3 uh, concept there, the next one, the what is it? O3 oh, black I'm hole I'm trying concept. to move to it. I'm just having a little trouble here. I'm gonna oh, okay. get there. All right, okay. there it is. Okay, and that one there, if you uh, expand it a little bit, uh, it says uh, it's treated uh, by all these people, especially if you look at the uh, Max Planck one there, it says it's not a tangible object, it's a region of space-time or space or whatever, and um, it, they treat it as an abstract mathematical concept. So what's the problem? The problem is that half the world in math treats it as a physical object, a little ball, it says that, a uh, star collapses or shrinks over time to to the to the point where it gets to be a little ball, black ball that's still floating in space out there, 
And the other half says, no, it's an abstract concept. This this star completely disintegrated, became zero dimensional. There's nothing there. And it becomes an opening in space time to another universe. So, so first we got to determine, is a black hole a black ball or is it a hole in space time? Is it a region of space time, a concept, or is it a, a standalone black ball? That's the first problem we got to resolve. And right. I'm saying there is no solution because they have never been able to, de you know, to to define that, and they never will. Well, to that, Peter, I tend to think that we all agree that a black hole is just a region of space that has extreme mass such that it is very highly gravitational. It is a point at which the gravitation force is enough to even uh, even swallow light, right? Uh. I would say that certainly that is the the concept, the how it's normally defined. I mostly agree with uh, actually in this case, uh, Bill uh, Bill's uh, prognost pro prognosticism or whatever it is of, prognostic of, of of the situation here regarding black holes. Um, if you uh, saw the 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 meme that I I threw up there, uh, I sort of give my two cents on 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 black holes at, uh, in general. Where you know you have the problem where you have uh, you cannot feasibly probe black holes uh, at the lengths and time scales uh, uh, of the dynamic behavior that you're trying that you're trying to explain at at least at the moment. So at, at so as a result, it remains a topic of mathematical speculation. So it's it's. I don't. I would not consider this in the realm of physics. As a result, this is off. It's often considered cosmology, perhaps, uh, for example, or, uh, or, and it's highly mathematical. So, well, uh, I mean, I, I kind of disagree well, with you both here. Black hole, Peter. Everybody out there believes they have been fed the story of the black hole, and there's not a single person out there that I can find that will tell you, "Oh no, black holes are speculative." Everybody takes it as a as a, a done deal. In fact, recently, uh, what was it? A couple uh, about a year ago or so, uh, two black holes collide, and they say, "Oh, uh, we can we have proven not only yeah. that black holes exist that was taken for granted, but the fact that it created gravity waves that reached the Earth, and they got a Nobel for it." And if you look at the uh, Wikipedia or you look at almost any source, they talk about a black hole as a done deal. There's there's no fine print. You know, it's it's a done deal. Uh, that's the problem. I, I mean, I, I, perhaps I don't know all the, the details of, uh, I mean, this is not, black holes are not exactly my specialty. As I mentioned last time, my specialty is in uh, foundations of quantum electrodynamics. Nonetheless, I would say that per, I they once you put a label on something such as a black hole, it tends to stick in, in these fields. And that's, yeah. that's that would be my, my response to that. I, I don't think we can really say, for example, that, it, it's as JF pointed out, you know, we we are pretty sure there's something quite massive that is pulling things in. Uh, and it probably is at the mag it's the magnitude is quite large to say that it's a singularity and to add all these other uh, additional assumptions. I I'm highly I'm highly skeptical of it. But this is a conceptual issue. This has nothing to do with, with looking through a telescope. It's got to do with what is a black hole, first of all. And second, uh, you know, uh, is it possible, is it possible, as you just said, that a runaway mass can pull on an object? Mass is a concept. I need to know the physical mechanism. In fact, I sent um, um, you folks there. Uh, can you look at... Um, the uh, uh, what is it? The um, uh, fable of the elephant and the turtle. That'll explain it very well. <laughs> I think. So, which number is that? Is that an illustration uh, you wanted me? Yeah, that's uh, number. What is that? Let's see. That's one ten. One hundred ten. Fable elephant turtle. All right, there it is. Let me go over that because that illustrates the problem completely. The fable of the elephant. There we go. So what, what, what do we have to understand here? Okay, here, here, this is the fable. It says, uh, one, there's, once there were two camps, right? There was uh, a camp of mathematical physicists, and they were the elephants. 
and they did measurements and calculations and they only respected one thing and that was size. And among them was the biggest elephant possible. He weighed 30 tons. He was twice as big as any of the other elephants. And on the other side of the river, you've got a, um, a colony of turtles, right? And they were physicists. Uh, they were not mathematical physicists, they were physicists. And, uh, you know, they were slow, but they were very intelligent. And among them was, you know, uh, one of the persons that they, uh, one of the turtles they respected the most, uh, his name was Bill. Build the turtle. <laughs> okay, so Build the Turtle had heard that um, uh, the uh, elephant, the number one elephant on the other side, his name was Dumbo. And since he was so big, everybody knew him as Jumbo Dumbo. Okay. okay. And so uh, the, uh, the turtle crosses the river and goes to the other side and goes to talk to Jumbo Dumbo. And so what happens? Well, uh, to, to make a long story short, uh, he said, look, I heard, Dumbo, that uh, you claim that you can affect things from a distance without touching them. And Dumbo says, yeah, exactly. You're, you're right. And he says, well, well, how do you do it? Well, I do it through my mass. See, I have so much weight. I weigh 30 tons and I can affect things from a distance just through my mass. And he says, that's so. Yeah, let me show you. And so uh, Dumbo starts turning around, you know, he spins in, uh, and uh, the turtle, you know, he uh, starts orbiting around the elephant. And so he, he says, see, see how I'm doing that? He says, uh, I'm doing it only through my mass. It turns out that what Dumbo did not understand or did not know was that the turtles had the ability to see in the ultraviolet range. They could see ultraviolet light. And so the turtle noticed real quick that what Dumbo had done is attach a stick to his shell and he was twirling him around through the, through, you know, uh, uh, because of the stick. And so, uh, and he could not convince all the other elephants that that was the case because they couldn't see the stick. And so, well, you know, to make a long story short, uh, the, the story does have a happy ending, a very happy ending, because it turns out that, you know, some poachers uh, eventually shot uh, Dumbo. They cut off his head and put it on, uh, on their living room wall, and they chopped off his tusks, ground them into ivory dust, and sold it on the Chinese market as, you know, fertility symbols or whatever and uh, then anyway, the turtle it, was the, moral, the turtle like ex okay, exploded the moral of the story, but let me get the moral of the story the moral of the story never believe a dumbo mathematical physicist regardless of how jumbo he claims to be all that comes out of the mouth of a dumbo mathematical physicist is mumbo jumbo you guys are going so hard on the standard model. Normally, I'm the one who, who takes the, the, the edgy positions on this show, but I feel like now I need to stand for the standard model. When we say black holes exist, I don't mean that the singularity in the Einstein equation is a proper description of the inner functioning of a black hole. What we mean is that we've looked at these galaxies and these solar systems elsewhere, and we saw little stars spinning around around a very massive thing that didn't emit light. And we can guess that this thing is so massive that it's what we call a black hole. We don't know, we don't know everything that goes on into a black hole, but we know that there are these huge masses, uh, often at the center of galaxies, at least. And they, they tend to, uh, there are stars just rotating around these things. It's not true. Absolutely not. It has nothing to do with mass. It has nothing to do with mass. It's got nothing to do with runaway singularities, uh, infinite uh, uh, mass. And, you know, again, we need a mechanism. And mass is not a mechanism. Mass is a mathematical concept. You cannot say that I pull on you through mass. I can pull on you with a rope. I can pull on you with a chain, with some elongated object. I cannot pull on you with mass. Even if I weigh like, you know, Dumbo there, he's got runaway mass. He cannot pull on the turtle with mass. You got to explain the mechanism. Bill, Bill. The mechanism have, is the bending of space-time. And I do have an alternate mechanism, which I've sent you there. I have an alternate mechanism, a physical mechanism of this phenomenon you call black hole. And you can see it Bill, there. Bill, Bill, can, can, we, can we agree 
that mass is at least a property of the objects we're talking about? Absolutely not. Mass has nothing, nothing, nothing whatsoever to do with a black with a phenomenon we attribute to black holes. The, I can show you if uh, if you put up there what is it 101 Cygnus X1 101 Cygnus uh, X1 101 Cygnus X1 Is it possible I don't have this because I have 111 Bird's Beak Linear Regime Yeah but you have one before that 101 you don't see that No nope. because uh, that, that what that's that is illustrate how they found the first black hole Okay, well, while I go to make sure that I downloaded everything from you, maybe maybe we can answer the question. The problem is, do you recognize gravitation? I, of course, but we need to find out what gravity is, what physical object is causing gravitation. That's what we need to figure out. What's the invisible object that gets in touch with my pen when I let go of it and compels it to go to the center of the Earth? That's what we need to identify. We have to make the invisible visible. And you say that gravitation is not dependent on mass? Absolutely. Well, it is dependent on mass. What I'm saying is the mechanism, the physical mechanism, has to have some elongated uh, entity, some mediator. Why does a parachutist right. fall to the earth? Why doesn't he fall to the, to the moon? Why doesn't he fall to the sky? Something is touching, the, something is coming in physical contact with the parachutist. And are you presuming, so of course there are mechanisms that this, that predict this. There are theories, mathematical, artistic theories, I would say. Uh -huh. But would you, this sounds a lot like the graviton, I would say. But perhaps you're alluding to the rope. I'm alluding to the rope, of course, because the graviton is a particle and I cannot pull with particles. That's the problem. Can Mathematical you, physics does everything with particles, and there are no such thing as particles. You cannot produce any phenomenon of nature. You cannot explain any phenomenon of nature. You cannot simulate any with particles. All right. Well, I would say when we get to it, uh, I, uh, I, think, I think JF's trying to pull something up, but later on I have uh, uh, a, a video to show that yeah, particles, it's really hard to deny the existence of particles, but... We'll get to that. <laughs> All right. So, uh, Bill, what I'm missing in terms of pictures, I didn't get an email with everything from 101 to 106. Uh, you didn't. OK, well, we can do with that. If you look at uh, Cygnus, uh, look at 106. Cygnus so X. I'm missing everything between 101 and 106. I have 107. Oh, 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 oh. What if problem. you want to take the time to send them to me, maybe you can take okay, that time. Okay, let me time. see if I can uh, give me a and second. And while you I'll do that, you, uh, <coughs> I, I will be reading one of the reactions of the crowd while you do that. Okay, uh, sure. Fizzes sends 10 euros. He says, what substance are ropes made of? And how can you prove it and observe it? Don't try to deflect the question with bullshit about how you don't need to prove it. So we will let Bill Gade, uh, get his, uh, his pictures in order, and then we'll get back to that question. But Peter, uh, I wanted to ask you about uh, what, what was my conclusion the first time I talked with Bill Gade. It is my impression that there could be such a thing that resemble rope properties in the building of the universe, in the way quantum fields are intermingled with each other, and, and there could actually be rope-like behavior in the way a photon just advances linearly through a 3D space. But I feel that quantum uh, field theory provides this this theoretical framework whereby you could have little fields that sometimes they behave more electro electrically sometimes they behave more magnetically and it does look like a rope when a photon advances through these fields would you agree i agree with most of what you said um uh there are there are, are certainly many analogs and it is a uh it does predict quite a bit of what we do observe that, or you can use something like what we, that Bill Gade uh, has to describe the same types of physics if one, and there's nothing wrong with that, uh, you know, describing the, the, the field theory instead of using something like uh, uh, oscillating particles, which is what we do now, uh, twisting ropes, sort of like a roto a, a rotary dynamics sort of model. It's interesting. Um, your, I would disagree with your point about 
light moving in straight lines, though. At the quantum level, we do n we have that was one of the papers that I sent to Bill. I, I don't know if you had gotten that bunch the first debate. Yes, I, I got your bunch. Well, I don't know if Bill if, if uh, JF did, but we do have evidence that part uh, light part light does not uh, move in trajectories that are strictly straight lines. Oh, so how, how does it move? I'm curious about this. So uh, I, I guess we you would one would need to go back to Feynman's path integral uh, formulation of quantum mechanics. Um, that's one. That is one uh, uh, way to describe it. So you can describe light as moving from point A to point B along a series of different uh, uh, paths simultaneously. It's not just, and you can restrict the particular paths that it might go. That is why when you have, say, your double slit experiment, you shine light uh, uh, on your double your double slit. You'll see a constructive interference peak right behind the slit. Your your zeroth order peak is will be bent around your your uh, your slit. It, that you can't explain that with a straight line with straight line paths. Very interesting. Only. And uh, one other thing, while Bill Gates is actually succeeding at sending me his pictures, so we'll get back to the discussion. But one other thing I was curious about is time. How does quantum physics touch time? Is that is that a dimension? Is that a property of the things? How how is, how do we conceive of time in quantum physics? Yes, it is a, a pra it's a parameter. Uh, Treated like just like you do in classical physics, it's a it's a it's a uh, a coordinate system like uh, space and time. Um, now, how you might interpret that is you know varies from person to person, but uh, it, yes, it is uh, it is just a coordinate as as spaces. But it uh, has a special property that uh, 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 at least in some systems you. It's an irreversible. It's it's not it's not something that you can, in most cases, go backwards in time as you can go backwards in space. <laughs> All right. So, Bill, I tried to I go backwards in time, but I'm still uh, 66. <laughs> 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 it doesn't happen. I don't know. I, I can't get the Earth to go in the other direction. All right. So, Bill, before the interruption, what did we want to talk about? We had the 101 Cygnus. The Okay, the 101 Cygnus, uh, what it does is show you how they supposedly discovered or proved black holes, and that is um, what you mentioned earlier, a star rolling around nothing. In other words, um, going around in circles or uh, orbiting uh, a center in which there is nothing. You're telling me I was deceived by this YouTube video showing this orbit? Uh, I don't see it. I don't see the orbit. Oh, sorry, I'm not, uh, am I showing it? Uh, yeah, yeah, there your, it is. Your screen's, oh, there you go. There it is. Okay, so this is this is how they discovered. They, they went in there and they saw uh, HD 226868, which is Cygnus X1, and they saw that this star was rolling around nothing. It was going to, to, to simplify, it, it, it's orbiting around nothing, okay? So that's how they came up with that one, right? And they said, okay, there must be a mass. And they put that mass, that black hole there by hand. They, they, they just inserted that, say, it's got to be mass. What else could it be? That was their conclusion, okay? And uh, then uh, you can jump to, um, uh, what is it, 106. All right. The Cygnus X1 rope model. This is the rope model. I'm saying this is not done with mass. It's done with um, uh, magnetism. It's a magnetic field of the of the entire galaxy that is moving the uh, star around. Remember, a star is a charged object. Okay, so uh, all stars are charged. All stars have magnetic fields. And if you look at uh, number 105, ball in magnetic field. Do, ch do stars tend to be charged negatively or positively? Well, uh, uh, <laughs> they're charged neutral. Uh, they're charged. Remember, uh, it's got a magnetic field. I'm talking about the magnetic field of a of a uh, ah. of a star. Now, if you look at that, there you can see what happens here on Earth. We can do this in the lab. You take a charged uh, whatever ball, 
and you put it in a magnetic field, it'll spiral around. That's a black hole right there. That's what's happening. What you have is the magnetic field of the entire galaxy swooping down on a star and forcing it to spiral around nothing. There is no mass in the center of that orbit. You have got to be kidding me, Bill Gates. You're telling me that the whole dark matter thing is like an adjustment that scientists have been doing, but that none of it relies on gravity. It's all a, mag a big magnet system. Okay, uh, let me let me show you another bit of evidence. I don't like to do evidence, but uh, here I'll give you evidence. Okay, look at the uh, last one there. Uh, where is it? Um, um, well, no, it's the same one. Cygnus, uh, uh, no, it's the, what is it? Which one is it? The uh, 103 spider web. 103 spider web. So there it is. Okay, I'm saying that all stars are interconnected. They have to be if every atom in the universe is interconnected by the ropes. So we have electromagnetic boat ropes binding any two atoms in the universe. That means that all stars are made out of atoms. They're connected to all other stars. Think of it as a spider web uh, that is superimposed upon the galaxy. So now we can see why the stars on the edge of the galaxy rotate just as fast or faster than the ones on the inside, first of all, and why a galaxy rotates as a single platform. It rotates like a, a bicycle wheel, in other words. It does, that's why, you know, the problem with the galaxy rotation problem that they cannot solve is how is it that the stars on the outside go faster than the ones on the inside? And you can see that in the curve. If you look at the curve there, it, it pretty much explains what the mathematicians are looking at. It's, uh, which one is it? Um, it's the number 06 dark matter graph. 06 dark matter graph. Now, you, now, can see what, you can see what happens there. If you look at the curve, uh, it disappeared. <laughs> Uh, th there it is. I think we're, oh, we're seeing it, okay. right? You can see the curve. Uh, it, you know, the bottom curve is what predicted what is predicted by Newton and uh, Einstein's equations. Instead, what they observe is that the stars on the outside have a greater speed than the ones on the inside. And they cannot explain that. And what they did was, if you look at now 109 dark kilograms, 109 right, dark kilograms. There it is. What they did is they put kilograms, mass, to cover the hole. They said, look, uh, there's this black, uh, th there's this dark matter that we cannot see. It's invisible, but it weighs a lot, just like the black hole. Invi they're, they're all conveniently invisible. They all weigh a lot, right? And they just put it in there. Why? Because the, the mathematicians deal only with mass. That's the only thing that came to their mind that could produce this effect. And instead, you know, if, if we interconnect every atom, if we can interconnect every star, we can see why the whole galaxy rotates as a single platform. We don't need to put this false mass in there, this, these kilograms, because that doesn't even explain why or what keeps one star attached to another star. If I put all this mass in there, you know, uh, what am I doing? I'm just uh, artificially producing uh, this effect by by saying okay I'm in my equation I'm going to be putting all this mass at different levels to produce this effect that's the only way they can do it but then they have to put the spirit called dark matter just like a spirit black hole because what they all want to explain it with mass this is fascinating Peter what do you think about this I'm still under shock of having to yeah. divorce from dark matter I was attached to my little uh, pot of dark matter <laughs> well. I okay. Let okay. Let's let's try to unpack a little bit of this. And uh, it's a uh, Bill is very good at uh, throwing a lot, quite a bit at us. Uh, but uh, he's uh, it's, I, I I really appreciate it. Now, when it comes to these magnetic fields that are spiraling these massive objects like a charged yeah. particle, if it is a magnetic field or what your or whatever a similar mechanism that we call a magnetic field, I think we we're in the we're. I, we're we're discussing the same thing. Um, yeah. Why, on a small scale, do you have positive you have positive and negative charged particles 
they will s spiral in opposite directions in a magnetic field. Whereas on this larger scale, you do not have such a dualistic of effect where you have spinning clockwise and counterclockwise based on something like charge. Why, why, doesn't that, why wouldn't that occur on a macroscopic scale? Well, keep in mind that, you know, again, a, uh, a um, star has a magnetic field. And we're talking about a little tiny, in, in comparison to the galaxy, a little star has a magnetic field. And what I'm saying, that magnetic field is within a bigger, much a gigantic, gigantic uh, magnetic field. And it's that field that's moving that little star around. It's affecting that star. Sure, but so, why? So we don't need we don't need the uh, electricity. See, you're you're referring to electricity right now. You're saying a, a charged object. When I'm saying uh, that a star is a charged object, I'm referring to the fact that it's got a magnetic field, and that a magnetic field can be affected by the galactic magnetic field. Right. But imagine if that mag that 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 magnetic field of that star was say they're not all going to be all. Are you suggesting that all the stars? Have the the magnetic field pointing in the same direction. The only way that your 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 model might work, and I'm not even convinced that it would, it, at least in terms of how, how we define magnetic fields, would be if all the magnetic fields were aligned. Then you can have the majority, if not all, of the stars spinning in the same direction. If you have, say, 50% of the stars having their their magnetic field uh, spinning flipped. Then you would have counter. You would have a mess of rotation. What? What? what well, uh, if, if you take a, a magnet, all the um, you know. When, uh, again, you got to look at what a magnetic field is, and it's the flow of threads. Uh, if you look at, let me let me just show this, uh, and it'll probably put it into perspective. I'm saying that a magnet. What what is a magnetic field? Uh, can you look at 104 magnetic in magnet in water? All right, there it is. Okay, if you put a magnet uh, in water and you, um, in, in other words, if you sprinkle iron filings at random in water and then suddenly you put a, a magnet, which is what, what they've done here, you can see that the uh, iron filings are collect collected one by one. See, it's, it's gradual. It's not like, you know, they're, they're, you know, when we do it in dry, when we throw uh, iron filings, sprinkle it over a magnet, uh, they're all there, they're all static, and you say, okay, yeah. But here you can see how the magnet is collecting them gradually, one by one. Yes. And the point is there is matter, like, like James Maxwell said, a magnetic field has matter in motion. There's some kind of exotic matter in motion. What I'm saying, those are the threads. Right. And the threads, the threads, are oriented in such a way that they force, they force every one of the iron filings to also align along the magnetic field. So you were right the first time when you were talking about the stars. If, if the galactic magnetic field is just a bunch of threads, gazillions of threads sweeping around the inside the center of the galaxy and out the outs out the edges, it's going to align every star in the same direction. So, therefore, you're pre you would predict then that the I don't predict. No, I don't okay. Predict. However, you have to use, however, you have to use, careful. You there are, there are a certain number of words we cannot use with Bill. <laughs> uh, I don't want that word prediction because that's astrology. Your Only claim, your claim, prediction. your cl your claim is that <laughs> all of the poles, all the north and the south poles, are all aligned of the different stars in the galaxy. That's the only way it works. So uh, I, would think, I would think that's the case because, you know, again, you have to remember, you have to remember that that's what a magnet does. It aligns everything in the north-south right. direction. Okay. So now if I have, say, if I throw charged particles at stars, okay, and they will have, it will have the same effect or some ch large, massive charged not a particle, but a massively charged part object. Say at the okay. at one, say the north part of a uh, of this star, you will be able to detect which way the uh, the stars are spinning, uh, are, are, are aligned. And yeah, so, again, uh, my best guess. Again, uh, I, all I can I'm highly skeptical. Of this. I can provide a mechanism and say. 
you know, I, I need a physical mechanism. I, I don't want to uh, go in there and say I can describe it, you know, with an equation. That's not physics. That's mathematics. I'm Do saying we, I need a physical mechanism. I got to show I got to show how it is that I uh, incorporate the black hole together with the galactic magnetic field in this case or the black hole phenomenon together with the galactic magnetic field. And I'm saying, yeah, you can do it with threads. You don't need mass. Do we have a way to know the north and south orientation of any star that's far from us? I don't know. No? Uh, uh, wow. I, 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 it's, as far it's as I know, no. you, you, need a, you need a probe. So if you have, say, like, if you have identifiable objects that are, say, charged, that are moving near this magnetic field, uh, then, you then you'll know which way it will deflect. And then it can, so you could right. send a probe, a charged probe towards these stars. Now it takes a long time to do that. And I don't think we actually know some of these massive objects. We, it's not easy. To, I could be wrong, but I don't think you can easily detect at the moment. Here's how we could resolve uh, the. Let me, a, let me live, give you a little clue, uh, Peter, because uh, they may be able to determine this in this in this way. Uh, you keep in mind that uh, they've discovered these jets coming out of the center of galaxies. They call them jets, and they think it's a black hole, a massive black hole in there that is uh, spitting out material like a geyser. Okay, right. that's what right. they're saying. Okay, and let's assume that's true. Let, let's assume that. We, we have some object, maybe a star or something, and it's observed being coming out of the center of the galaxy because it's being pushed by something. Well, then you know that that's the north side mm. of that galaxy because it's pushing it outwards and coming, you know, from the bottom up in, in that sense, okay? So, so we would know this is north charged. Is the and the, and the, the spouting part would be the north pole. But here's now, the problem with that. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I mean, I was just saying, it, then we would use this matter, we would have to see it, get to some star, and then we would know those stars' orientation. Yeah, but JF, the problem with this is the time scales. In order to yeah. the time scale yeah. to make to do this experiment are absurd. Uh, it's it's not it's frankly not going to happen. Um, now, uh, you can go ahead, but then I just wanted to say, Peter, there could be, within the formation of galaxy, a mechanism that aligns the stars. Maybe at the beginning, they were not all aligned, but by shaking some magnetic field, by, by, by some sort of inversion, you could end up with all the stars relatively aligned to a single direction. Here, here's one of the problems, is that magnetic, magnetic fields are, or electromagnetic, yeah, magnetic forces or magnetic fields, however you like to put it, are are not very well long range interactions as as long as as far as we can measure on the small scale. They don't. So the in order for the so to push something to get them all aligned uh, on on such a from at large distances, they would need to be this. The galaxies would need to form very close. All the stars close together for what you're describing to happen. Um, that's why in, you have like a magnet, you can get all the different, uh, uh, poles inside the, the dipoles inside of magnets all aligned because they're all very close together. It works out. But you, do agree, but you do agree that a galaxy has a, a galactic magnetic field. I would not say that the, well, it's yes. I would say that there are, there are charged moving particles and there are there is what we call a magnetic field. I prefer oh, I prefer potentials. I prefer potentials, as I said last time. But uh, the electromagnetic <laughs> no, potential. I'm saying, but, is there does a galaxy have a magnetic field? It's a yes or no question. Not I mean, in it's not the drawing. The the if we drew drew the field lines, it would not look. I don't think it would look like the way you. I'm, I'm quite certain you would not look the way that you've drawn. Why not? You've drawn it. Why not? For one, the the field the field lines aren't uh, uh, aligned the way they are. I don't the, the, the unless you reinterpret the way mag magnetism works on large scales, which we don't see with, with with when we put magnets together, it does not have such a strong strength strength far apart. The it's just it, it just doesn't work. Okay, um, let me ask you: the sun's magnetic field does it extend beyond Pluto? Weekly. Does it? It's a yes it or does. no. Very faint, faintly. It does. Uh, does yes. it, how far does it reach? It, it, well, it reaches all the way to interstellar space, way beyond. Sure, way but it, beyond it's very weak. 
So, so, so now the question is, does a, gal, a galactic magnetic field, where does that one extend to? Does it extend to the last star or beyond? You're, it's kind of like asking the butterfly uh, in Africa that is uh, flapping its wings. Does, it, <laughs> does the wind influence that? Is that uh, uh, blowing my cheek right now? I guess you can uh, say yes, it does extend that far, but uh, uh, I'm not. Don't need to uh, 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 put up a, a windshield for that at the moment. Well, I don't know. I'm saying that the galactic magnetic field extends far beyond, far beyond the last star in the galaxy. All right, uh, Peter, did that's you have something big, to that's add? That's how big a galactic magnetic field is. Yeah, I mean that's it is that far, but the it's not it's not it's not sufficiently strong. That's all I have to say about it. Yeah, it doesn't now, have to be really that strong. Have to be. Keep in mind that we don't need we don't need. Uh, I agree with you. It's it's not strong out there. It's strong near the not strong center. enough for what you're describing. What you're for what you're predicting. It's not strong enough to strong enough it, for uh, hold it. strong strong enough for what? What am I predicting? What are, what do you for 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 things like magnetic field alignments of these stars? Well, it's like saying that the iron filings that go around a magnet are not affected by the magnet. Of course, there's a range. After that, you know, if you pour more and more iron filings, right. you know, at some point, the magnetic field is not going to reach it. No, it's more like two magnets, two far, uh, very far apart. You're not going to, you, very close. One's going to flip as a response to the other. But right, if I right. send the magnet very far, you're not going to, one's not going to flip as a response to the other. Right, and I, and I agree. All I'm saying, all I'm saying, is that the magnetic field extends way beyond. Sure. Now. I'm not sure. saying that that it's strong out there. Where it is strong, that it's where it can produce the black hole phenomenon. That's where it can twirl a star around. But the magnitude matters. I know you don't like mathematics, but the magnitude, the math, the numbers, no, I agree. The it strength matters. matters. Of course, <laughs> I do agree with. <laughs> Of course, it in matters. order to 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 uh, to say that your 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 model works, it matters. Uh -huh. uh, now, Bill, class, but my model works. What? In order for it to work, the 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 mathematics matters. Yeah, of course, you have to Bill, describe it mathematically. I don't disagree. You've made a stunning case to me that okay, I could detach myself from the idea that mass is causing all this, then I would go for magnets. But then th th there needs to be a whole lot of rope to generate the kind of magnetic field you're talking about. And, and as we've seen in the Jesse Smollett case, any, any action that requires a rope leads to some guy having to go buy the rope. And we should have, <laughs> we, we should have cameras of people buying that much rope at the middle of the galaxy. How do you get okay. that many ropes at the center of your galaxy if it's not mass? Uh, you know, there's a there's a, um, a quote from Richard Feynman. He was a 1965 Nobel Prize uh, in, phys in mathematical physics, and he He's said you know, that that there was a, a ratio between the magnetic field and the gravitational field, and it's a ratio of 10 to the 47. And he says, "Where does such an enormous number come from?" Well, now we know how many threads or how many ropes there are in the at least uh, in in our galaxy. You know, maybe there's more. But my point so you're is, saying you know, magnetic how, many atoms, how many atoms are there in a galaxy? How many atoms are there in a star? So you're talking about gazillions and gazillions of ropes of threads. Those form the magnetic field. Also, it's not so much that there's something at the middle. It's the combined effect of all the atoms in the galaxy that generate this field. The, every star generates a field that uh, extends way beyond the planets, like in our case, the solar system. Uh, the, the magnetic field of the sun extends way beyond uh, Pluto. And just imagine now every star with that. Every star has a magnetic field. It contributes to the magnetic field of the galaxy because it, the, the magnetic field of the galaxy originates in the, in the magnetic fields of the stars. And so the, these, all these threads are going up the center of the galaxy, coming on the outside, and they help maintain the integrity of the entire galaxy, while meanwhile all the stars are interconnected to each other, and that thing, the whole thing rotates like a carousel. That's my proposal.
Peter, what do you think about this? It sounds to me like Bill is suggesting a kind of self-organizing principle whereby originally decoordinated magnetic field co could coordinate and could naturally uh, kind of emerge into a spiral of aligned uh, structures. Well, I, I, I'm highly skeptical that these what we call magnetic fields can sufficiently describe what Bill is doing is is trying to describe. Now, if on the other hand uh, there was a separate a separate type of rope, there was rope rope ma gravitational rope and magnetic rope, uh, where the strengths are different, where the number of ropes differ, so that there's maybe more different types of rope that are connecting, for example, my two balls. I have not only my electric rope and my magnetic rope, but then my gravitational ropes, for example, and they tug at different strengths. Then I, I might be on board. But that's not the model. That's not my model. My model is if you twist those, those two around, you get one rope. The blue and the red are, are threads, okay? The blue and the red are threads. The rope is is what the threads do when they're they're twined around what i'm saying is the magnetic field is composed of threads not of ropes but of threads right. so it's the threads that are going around because they're swung around when you have a line uh, a, a row of aligned atoms there are merged they the whole line swings around and they swing the threads around that's a magnetic field it's the yeah, swinging so I of Countless threads around a line, a row of aligned atoms. That's what I'm, we're going to call a, a field. And so, uh, if, for people who will remember our past episode, essentially the magnetic field is one of the thread, the, the magnetic one, right? That is being swung like a children just in a in a in a school, just swinging a rope around his body. That's it. And the the, the red right. stays in the line of atoms. Uh, the um... My, my son corrected me. I like his idea better. He said both threads swing around. One swing both is threads? You know, up the other one around. So they're both swinging around. And I think that's a better model than the model I originally had in mind, which was that one of the threads comes out. I think both threads really swing around. And a magnetic field is composed of both. But based on the, the question from Peter, isn't that a problem that matter seems to display effects that are both magnetic in nature and gravitational in nature, given that in your model, the same rope or the same threads are operating these two effects? How do you deal with the combined uh, effects that are sometimes gravitational, sometimes magnetic, when they both happen to the same atom? Well, that's uh, I, again uh, when the um, when when you have a magnetic field, the rope now you know disassociates itself. In other words, it doesn't break it. It just the threads come out. They start swinging around, but then because of the because the threads are swinging around, they're pushing outwards. That still maintains the tug between two atoms that are part of that magnetic field. There's no gravity in the sense of, uh, you know, a rope connecting them. But the, the fact that the two threads are pulling outwards during the spinning of the two threads, uh, that already maintains the integrity of those two atoms together. In other words, they don't fly apart because of that. Well, let's say, let's say I have two, two atoms in a magnet. Are they gravitationally yeah. attracted to each other? Or are you saying that what, what keeps them together is totally different from what brings the moon to the sun or the moon to the earth? Well, what, uh, in that case, in that case, I'm saying that if you have two atoms that are interconnected by a rope and the rope now starts, you know, the two threads come apart and they start swinging around, that maintains the tug between those two atoms. Why would they what? fly apart? I mean, why would they? <laughs> well... Well, Bill, this I mean, is a I mean, you got the model there, Peter. Show us, show us the model one more time, please. Sure. Well, Bill, uh, you know, I'm joining if, your. If you pull, I'm, I'm, let, I'm, me explain, let me explain that. If you pull them apart, if you pull the uh, two threads apart, do the balls go flying outwards? No. Right. If I if I, if I cut the rope, then I will. Then, then no, I will, no. But, yeah. if, uh, I'm not cutting the rope. I'm saying the thread. If you pull on the two threads, the balls don't fly apart. That's what so I'm they saying. are still attached through a limited length of the the cords. It's just that the cord is in a different configuration around the atoms. 
Right, because what I'm saying is the threads are now spinning, and because they're spinning, they, that already keeps the two atoms close together. It's not like the two atoms now can fly apart. All right. Now, so, I'll do uh, oh, Go ahead, Peter. So, yeah, so I, I, ha I have joined, uh, uh, indeed, uh, Bill's, inst I wouldn't call him what he's doing necessarily physics. I would call it uh, topological art. Uh, and that's we're using uh, geometry uh, without a metric. Uh, so it's topology, and we're really playing with art here. He makes fantastic videos. Uh, it's just a kind of a jab there. Um, but I like, yes. I like your model. <laughs> Send um, it to me. I'll buy it from you. <laughs> no, we'll do. It's a high price, but sure. So, Bill, uh, now, my question is, how do we get these uh, these swinging ropes? I guess my question would be, what is the difference between magnetic matter, matter that generates a field, and matter that doesn't generate? What gets it rolling with the ropes, and what gets the rope detached and starting to generate a magnetic field? Uh, well, you get a stimulus. Um, again, what, what happens is we have to understand electricity. Unfortunately, I, you know, I didn't know you were going to ask that question. Otherwise, I would have sent you a, uh, a little uh, gif there. But, but this is, let's see if I can explain it. You know, what is voltage? You know, these people don't know what a voltage is. They always explain it through analogy. They say, look, if you got a high spot here in the river, flows to the lower side because there's a difference in potential. That's all they tell you. And you haven't understood squat because all they did was give you an analogy of, you know, maybe a river or something like that. And I'm saying what, what it is, is very simple. Voltage means clockwise and counterclockwise. That's all that mother nature understands. So if you have a row of atoms, you have a row of atoms, right? From my end, it, they turn clockwise. From your end, they turn counterclockwise, even if you turn the, the row in, in a curve. Like if you have a wire, right? You have uh, electricity flowing through that wire. What is it? From my end, from my starting point, they're going clockwise. Hopefully, by the time you get to the other end, they're going counterclockwise. And that's what voltage is. Okay, so, so voltage is simply a, a spinning clockwise or counterclockwise of a row of merged shells, electron shells. Okay, so all these atoms are interconnected, and that's what electricity is. All right. So, Peter. so, Bill, so yeah. Bill, I would say to, to, uh, to use your model, uh, yeah. if you want to define what uh, voltage is, is a voltage is if, say, you're using two electrons, it is, a me it is a measure of the stored potential energy of the system. And what we would mean by that would be the measurement of the number of twirls uh, or, uh, or tw uh, spins in the particular rope. I think that would be a little bit more accurate. Counterclockwise would be, say, positive, and then clockwise would be negative. Would you agree with That's that? Be the, uh, voltage has nothing to do with a rope. Voltage is atoms. Volt electricity is atoms. In other words, you have to have merged shells. All atoms are inter or are are merged. The shells, the electron shells, the outer shell merges with the guy next to it. You have a row of merged shells, and they're all spinning in the same direction. That's electricity. Voltage is whether from one end it's going to be clockwise, the other one end it's going to be counterclockwise. It's not the rope. Rope. Uh, the rope does light. Uh, it's atoms that do electricity and voltage. I would say that no, the voltage, the voltage we're talking about, the light, the lights that we, we talk about light is a is an oscillation. It's a wave of the voltage or the yeah. electromagnetic voltage. Yeah, it's a wave, uh, whatever wave is. But it's, so but it's not the atoms. A wave is a concept. We, we can't use the word wave but in physics. Wave is of, a of the rope. It's 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 a, a wave. It would be a wave of your rope. It would be say you have a you have yeah, a, torsion. a, a traveling torsion. Uh, torsion, but it wouldn't be it wouldn't be then it wouldn't be your atoms. If these are your atoms and then this is your rope, they would be distinct objects. I would say. Yeah, what I'm saying is if you if you put put the model again, the two balls are connected. If you touch them, touch the two balls there. Just touch them. That's electricity. They're both spinning in the same direction from your uh, left hand, uh, from your, yeah, from one hand to the other. It, they're spinning in uh, clockwise, for example, both of them, like, like. Okay. That. So from one end, it's clockwise. From the other end, it's got to be counterclockwise.
and that's voltage. I'm saying that it's merged shells. A row of merged shells is electricity. And voltage is simply a stimulus that you give to that row of merged shells. Now, Bill, uh, given that you are talking about merged cells, uh, what about the valence electrons, the fact that copper and gold are good at uh, transmitting electricity? It does seem like it, it confirms some sort of a electron-based theory of physics. Uh, how do you explain it from the perspective of the ropes? Are they just matters that are more easy to merge? Well, keep in mind that, you know, how do they, what is uh, this, um, what is it, the uh, molecular orbital theory? They don't use the electron at all. They throw the electron bead away. They throw it in the trash can. They forget about that. And they start dealing with what? With orbitals. What the hell is an orbital? There's no such monster as an orbital. An orbital is a balloon. You can merge balloon, but you cannot merge trajectories of electron uh, beads which is what they're doing. They're saying, look, uh, an orbital is just a region, region, which is a concept, not an a, a solid object. It's a region where you can find the electron bead. Then they get rid of the bead and they say, now let's merge the shells. Let's merge the orbitals. And I'm saying those orbitals that they've been talking about for 100 years are actual shells that are weed by the, um, the, the threads. And when two merge, two shells merge, now we can have this uh, molecular orbital theory with objects, not with abstract concepts like, you know, orbitals. There's no such thing as an orbital. Orbital is just a, a way of saying, look, we're still, we're not going to get rid of the bead, but we can't explain, you know, molecular orbital theory with the bead. So let's get rid of the bead. Let's do it with the, let's do it with the orbit. Well, that's a critique of the standard model, but you still don't have an, an explanation. Why is copper so good and, and gold so good at transmitting electri electricity? Well, we would have to look at the specific case. I can't off the top of my head just tell you right now, you know, the, this. Right. Answer to that question. I, I, I would have to look at uh, the specific case. Uh, well, yeah, you bring up a good, an interesting point, uh, JF. I mean, uh, the only small uh, minutia, I don't mean to be uh, what you like to call uh, autistic about it, though I, that's not really autism, just trying to make sure they use the words correctly. Uh, it would be uh, conducting electrons, not uh, extra valence electrons, but uh, that's an idea here. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Uh, Why would the electrons be moving from one atom to another? Why would the electron bead go from one atom to another? Well, why, why, why do molecules of water in a river, why do they get pushed down the river? Yeah, but listen, listen, we're talking about an electron bead. What compels a bead to jump from one atom to another? What well, physical because there's more bead on this side and there's, the there's less beads on the other side, Bill. And, and, and that doesn't mean that the bead is going to go there. Absolutely not. That's magic. That's uh, doing it with spirits. What you're saying is a bead just moves... For no reason, nothing touches it. Nothing comes in contact with the bead, but the bead simply jumps to another atom. Why would that? Because happen? because so, the beads are self-rejecting. Because one bead is electrically negative, the other bead is electrically negative. It will naturally no, flow negative, toward no, where there's no bead because the magnetism will push the beads, the 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 negative beads, away from themselves. There's no such thing as negative or positive in physics. That's also a mathematical concept. That's like saying, look, we're just going to name this one X, the other one a Y. You know, X moves this way because of God, and the Y moves that way because of spirits. That's all so, we're saying. You're saying. There's so, no so, reason for a positive bead to go anywhere unless something comes in physical contact with the bead. The, the, the physical thing that comes into contact is the the intermediate photon or the intermediate light particle that interacts between say two electrons. Now you what call that happened? rope, but that, that, that is uh, the mediator. Uh, so it is so like a you're game. You're going to do this with particles. You're saying that we have a bead and we have right. another bead, a, a particle you call a photon. And, and, and how does this bead? So we're just shooting it, right? One, well, one is shooting a bead to the other one. It's like, so Brian Greene has a great analogy on this. Imagine that you have two, uh, uh, a, a father and a son, and they are two electrons, okay? And they both have, uh, they're playing baseball, right? And they, uh, they are throwing a photon, which is the ball, at each uh, uh, back and forth between each other. 
that's the photon, and there's a recoil force that pushes them uh, uh, when they when it strikes their mitt. There's a recoil force that uh, pushes them back. This is what is the mechanism how we, uh, if you want to be descriptive, uh, to describe how the photon uh, pushes the two electrons apart. And the same type of mechanism would be used to describe uh, the interaction between uh, li- uh, 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 electrons and nuclei. Okay, now, now using that same mechanism, right? Let, let's see if you can continue because that's where quantum falls completely on its butt. Explain pull now. Tell me how a quark pulls on another, throwing a gluon bead at it. A gluon, or do we talking about? Can we keep oh, the photons? Gluon. Uh, what 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 Let's is not the throw. between quarks? Isn't it the gluon? Well, well, how about? Well, yes, you're right in that we have not uh, 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 sufficiently and you described. Never will. You never will with particles. You I'm not. Will. But but how about a nuclei? So a nuclei and an electron in terms of a pull. We don't need to go to quarks. So we can talk about say a nuclei, which is a bunch of protons and neutrons, but so something positively charged. And an electron. Positive we don't need to talk about quarks. In that I don't understand positive. That's not a, a, positive, a word of physics. It's a word of religion. The proton. Sorry, the proton. My apologies, Bill. The proton, <laughs> the nucleus, the the bundle of particles of 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 protons and neutrons is the nuclei, and they're throw. There's uh, so they so yes. The 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 glove would be different for. Uh, Interaction would be different for a a positive charge versus a negative charge, and it would yeah, it that's, would that's... it would depend back on your 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 your, your polar. Oh, this is this is this is more difficult, but yes, I, I admit. But uh, somehow the glove gets uh, sucks back in, which is unphysical at least on our scale, but does not mean that it's not phys- it's not physical on the the smaller scale. If you ben. humans humans cannot conceptual humans cannot conceptualize conceptualize Fair enough. Okay? forget about we cannot conceptualize pull uh, mediated by particles we cannot explain ben. gravity and we cannot explain how a quark pulls on another quark with particles period Bill, I'm going to make it very easy here because uh, you don't like bringing the proton and the fact that it's positively charged to freaking yeah. magnets they pull each other. Yes. How do they do it? Uh, how does how does a magnet pull on another one with particles? I have no clue. I would I would have to of have uh, Feynman. Feynman, help particles. me, Feynman. <laughs> you never will. With particles, you can never do it. You would have to introduce magic in there. The only way you can do it is like I'm saying. The threads are going around. They latch onto another to each other. Now you can pull. Yes. But you can't do it with particles. Never. That's why we don't have a, an explanation to this day of how a magnet attracts another. Because, you know, you can't do it with particles. You can't do it with quantum. Hey, hey Bill, I have a question. This is a, yes. a, a more, I, I, I find this to be more a, of a communication style issue more than something about physics. Uh, it's a conceptual why, So you, so using reasoning for uh, say real world interpretive in uh, 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 reasoning as opposed to understanding abstractions. Well, now, abstractions, abstractions is magic. If you can, why is it magic? You cannot conceptualize it. It's why magic because if someone it, says a positive particle attracts a negative particle, he's introducing spirits. He hasn't said anything. Bill, Bill, it sounds like it sounds like that uh, you cannot conceptualize it. No, no. I want you to conceptualize it for me. How does positive attract negative? What does positive mean physically? Physically. You, you're, but you. So physically, in terms of if I go to the hardware store and uh, ask for something positive, is what you're asking for. I'm saying, I'm saying, you just gave an example of father throwing a ball to son, right? Right. I want you to conceptualize for me how father throws a ball to son and pulls on him. So That's what let's, I want someone to conceptualize for me. It's so a here, conceptual he, issue. So here, 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 here would be one. Okay, instead of now the sun, instead of having a a mitt, he has a a, a tube. Okay, a tube where the ball comes in, uh-huh. it gets loops around, an elongated, and then, ob- an elongated object, right? In, oh no, a, a, a twisted object. 
an a curved object. An elongated object. Let's clarify. A curved, a curved object. Yeah, but it's an elongated one, one that connects one to the other. No, no, no. The the boy is holding it. The boy boy is holding, say, uh, this uh, tube. Yeah, that but is, it's an elongated that object. Curves between, around. It's an elongated object between your two hands. That's my point. No, no, no. I'm the boy, and you're the you're the uh, you're the father. You throw the ball to me. The ball yeah. comes into my tube. Tube. It tube. twirls around, and then yeah. instead of a mitt, it it twirls around in the tube and gets and and pushes when it hits the end of the tube, and then pulls me towards you. Why would it pull towards you? It's the tube that's pulling. The the because the, the photon in this case would would pull me towards you. Build, uh, why Jeff, why would it pull you? Why because of the tube? I, I might need a pick. I might need a drawing for this better than why did, uh. Use, why did you introduce the tube? That's my question. Why did you put a tube? So that it could twirl. So that the, ah, the, ah, but you need an elongated object called the tube. But it doesn't need to extend. It doesn't need to extend from one uh, uh from me to you. I can you hold on to the tube. Can I, I can, can I pull on you with a curved ball? Can I can you throw with me a curved ball? I, can no. I pull on you. Can I pull on you with a curved ball? Yes, no, if you if you allow the Einstein uh, bending of the universe, there could be a curve <laughs> that goes back and pushes you back in. <laughs> a wormhole, wormhole curved ball that would work. No, but I mean, uh, th this is a fundamental thing that every time I discuss with Bill, we end on this. Bill rejects the idea of pulling, essentially. He says there is only one way to move object. It is to push them. Uh, and you can have a rope, of course, which, which will give you the impression that you're pulling. But what you're really doing is you are pulling on the rope, which is pushing on something, which is your grip on the, the rope. Uh, it's. Uh, I, I don't know what to say about this, Peter. Well, I mean, because he's for he's forcing his hand in terms of the interpretation being a, f a physical interpretation in in something that we 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 uh, understand classically. That's 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 the catch. I mean, if yeah. if you but there are physical mechanisms that that I'm trying to that I'm trying to. And it's a bit silly, but you can illustrate. For example, you could have a mechanism where, say, your ball uh, uh, enters your the boy is holding this uh, this tube where the ball enters the tube. And then comes around and then hits the end of the tube. And then once it slaps the end, it pushes him in this direction towards the father, which is on the other side. I, I digress. So you're, you're producing pull by push. Yes. So you cannot produce pull, pull in the religion of quantum mechanics, no matter how you do it. Is that correct? You cannot produce pull. Like, I like didn't say that. Donkey, like straight ahead. I, you cannot produce it. You have to go through this push mechanism, well, uh, this, this uh, Casimir effect type yeah. mechanism where you remove particles or where well, you push the guys together. That's well, the way you just pull. To be, to be honest, Bill, this is actually something that I, I, I ascribe to. There is so I'm glad you brought up the the Casimir effect. The so. Casimir does the Casimir effect. Uh, so, for people who don't understand, uh, to, to explain, you have say two uh, charged uh, neutral plates, and then you have a photon that is not just bouncing back and forth between the plates, but it is uh, there is an elongated photon uh, in Bill's term. There are normal modes of photons that interact inside this plate as opposed to outside. There are more modes of the photon, like sort of harmonics outside versus the restricted modes inside the mode. And as a result, they come together. So in, it, it, are there, is there, so this is actually quite uh, uh, na it's natural. You can imagine, for example, two electrons or two uh, positively charged particles uh, in Bill's, in, uh, in, as in Bill's example, where the photon is uh, uh, everywhere along the, the, the uh, the, between the two particles. This is a strength that I think uh, might have some veracity. Uh, now, I should mention that uh, up until now, but say between two electrons, we have not uh, observed the cashmere effect. And there is quite a bit of, of experimental speculation in terms of even the, the cashmere effect that we've measured with, uh, with metal. Have we actually seen it? 
All I can say is comment the following. The reason quantum mechanics has never discovered the, uh, the graviton and never will is that you cannot produce gravity with particles. Period. We're done. And they never will. They, they cannot conceptualize. They cannot conceptualize how a pen falls to the floor with particles. What is the earth throwing? Particles at the pen? I mean, how is it done? It's very simple. The pen has to be connected, physically connected to the center of the earth. Then we can explain it. We can explain it with ropes. We cannot explain it with particles. And we never will. That's why quantum, 100 years later, cannot explain gravity. Maybe. Uh, I'm not, I, I don't think, uh, I, I, I'm not, there are a lot of interpret, of course, uh, gra we, 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 there are, there is a lot of issues with gravity. I, I won't deny it. I'm not uh, in the field of gravity. I should mention, by the way, that we have not even observed for small particles. We've never even measured the gravitational effects on most of these particles. It's a very difficult thing to do. We have I'm never, not... we've never, so it's, 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 it's hopeless to some degree uh, in part because we, we cannot, we haven't even say measured yet how, if the electron falls. But hold it, Peter. I'm not, talking about, I'm not talking about the invisible subatomic world. I'm talking about just the regular everyday world in which we live. No, you said quantum. quantum. You, no, you no, said no. Quantum. Forget about quantum for a second. I'm saying uh, general relativity explains the cosmic world. Here on Earth, we have to explain the falling of a pen to the table. We have to explain it in, in regular terms. How does a pen fall to the table? I mean, you know, here we're talking about this distance. What is it? From here to the table. How do we explain that simple uh, thing? How do you explain with particles? You cannot. You never will. And that's the problem with quantum. Quantum dies with gravity. What's your There's position no on this, Peter? Will there be a graviton detected? Or do you think that quantum physics will just get eaten by relativity and eventually by rope theory? <laughs> I would say I would say that Bill Bill is jumping the gun to some degree because uh, even because the pro the problem with uh, his his framing is that if we're talking about the pen falling, yeah, we don't we don't even have a complete even if you take aside the gravitational effects of this pen, we don't ha we are still uh, working on completing the the full theory of how uh, this pen operates by itself, uh, how macroscopically. How can it be, Peter? I mean, we're talking about a pen and a table. That's the entire system. Why, what, why can't a mathematician on Earth just explain to me how this pen falls to the table? That should be very simple. Are, are you, in terms of part, in terms of particles, I mean, you're, you're talking yeah. about on on the. Are you asking from a quantum point of view? What's the point yeah. of view you're asking it from? How would quantum explain this simple phenomenon? We, so it's kind of like asking uh, uh, a, a biologist uh, use uh, cells. No, use the uh, yeah use the organelles to describe why. Uh, uh, when I chew uh, 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 potatoes, it tastes no. That's not even good. Why some people like? Oh, okay. I think I think it's 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 there's too far of in terms of scales to even describe it, describe it accurately. But Peter, a, 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 a science of physics should be able to explain how the pen falls. That's a simple it, it, thing. It should be able to explain it. This is sure. very simple. And, sure. and here we are, 2,000 years later, We not a single mathematician on earth from Harvard or from Cambridge can explain how a pen falls to the table. They cannot explain that simple phenomenon. That's ridiculous because this is the simplest. All we have is a pen and a table. That's the entire system. If it, someone cannot explain that, something is terribly wrong. Maybe. <laughs> But with ropes, every atom is connected to the table. Very simple thing. We're done. But 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 we but we can use a quantum theory of your ropes if we, as I said, <laughs> with the cashmere effect. Uh, you you ha and uh, I I had I had forgotten to bring that up last time. But uh, yes, if you uh, the 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 field uh, uh, which is describing the the rope or the the particles moving around between uh, macroscopic objects. You can have some sort of effective fall, but it's it's a. Uh, 
I'm not, I'm not an ex. I, I, I personally cannot explain it. I, I'm not. I've never looked for in the literature how does the pen fall. So I, I'm okay. out of my wheelhouse here. That's that's for the next uh, day of cheap presentation. <laughs> All right, guys. I have to leave for one minute. But Peter, I wanted you to explain to our crowd. Are you familiar with the uh, with quantized inertia? People are asking questions about this. Are you familiar with the concept quantized inertia? I, I I am not. Would you like me to look it uh, look it up while you're uh, during the uh, one minute well, break? Well, uh, in any case, you guys can discuss anything you want. I'll be back in a minute. Uh, Bill, I don't know if you had something to add or Peter. And Peter, you can uh, you can Google quantized inertia. I'll be back in maybe thirty seconds. Okay. Quantized inertia. Let's see what that is. They invent new concepts instead of uh, make simplifying. We make it complicated. Quantized. Fringe theory. Okay. It's a fringe theory. <laughs> wow yeah. all right guys i'm sorry no. i had something to do now quantized inertia from my understanding i've been viewing a video about it and quantized inertia would be a phenomenon by which movement creates uh creates event horizons that differ from your back to your forward so if you look back there are certain lights that you will not see but since you're accelerating in that direction there are certain lights that you can see more uh, in front of you. In other words, you are losing some some of your event horizon on the back, and you're gaining some on the uh, forward part. Uh, did you did you read about quantized inertia, Peter? While I was gone. Uh, yes, I mean, so there, there, so. I, it's interesting. Uh, I'm not a. This is a very much a meeting of of uh, G, uh, general relativity and uh, light. Uh, I'm not much of a of an expert in general relativity to be able to uh, uh, to make any educated uh, 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 comment on this. Uh, I would only say that yes. Well, there's nothing. You should much check it out because this. there's a twist then because they they say that there are uh, photon and anti photon pairs that 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 are born from nothing and they eliminate and they say it's going to be different in your backward direction than in your forward because there are going to be some events of creation of matter that will happen more forward than backward and ultimately this is this gives an explanation oh. of inertia. There's more creation of matter in a direction rather than the other well i would say there is there are uh mechanisms by which inertia can already be explained uh with classical electromagnetism rather than even getting into the crazy quantum uh, uh in jackson's electromagnetism uh, textbook he actually explains how uh, there's a self-interaction between the light that is mediated uh out of the uh 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 the uh uh, the a charged particle as it's moving, uh, and it in that light interacts back on itself, and ultimately gives rise to inertia. And you can derive uh, the inertial mass of objects. It seems that uh, uh, this would be uh, an unnecessary complication. Now, I would need to uh, try to understand what would be the mechanism of how a uh, an anti photon would be created. This seems a little bit uh, interesting. All right. Well, right. let's let's talk about it in the future, Bill. I can uh, clarify something about this um, inertia deal, <laughs> but oh, yeah? I'll do it. I'll do it rationally. I won't do it with irrational nonsense. Uh, <laughs> if, you up, if you put up one eleven Bird's Beak linear regime, can you put that one up there? Yep, uh, here it is. Okay, if you can make that a little bigger, it would be great. I don't think I can, unfortunately. Oh, okay, okay. Maybe I can try well, this. Great. 
Uh, if every atom from the sun is connected to every atom of Proxima Centauri, that's our nearest star, 4.3 light years away, Mo uh, if, if uh, all these atoms are interconnected by ropes, okay, here we have all the stars in, in a given region of the sun, of the sky, and they're all interconnected. Well, if you have the, uh, in that case, uh, we have the enterprise there trying to uh, get out of the sun, out of the solar system. Well, in the Bird's Beak area there, uh, we would have gravitation that uh, uh, that it can be described by Newtonian um, for, by the Newtonian equation. But when you get into this linear region, which will come up here in a second, see it goes into the linear region, and then yep. gravity is not the same in that region as it was in the bird's beak. So now you have inertia in front of you because. What happens is you, you've uh, exited the Newtonian region, the Newtonian range, which is only in the bird's beak. That would explain, for example, why the uh, pioneers are slowing down. As soon as any object wants to leave the solar system, it is going to go through that bird's, uh, from that bird's beak to the linear uh, region, to the linear regime. But how can there be a bird's beak if all of the atoms are linked linearly? They're linked. Li well, Im imagine you and I are holding uh, many ropes, right, in our hands. The farther you get away, the more the ropes will, you know, in the center between us. You'll have a region where all the ropes converge and act as a single coaxial. That's my point. Okay. You can't avoid it. It's it's a physical necessity. And so what I'm saying is gravity. The the square root the, the the square of the of the distance factor is only in the bird's beak region of the solar system. Once you get in the region between two stars, you get into this linear region. You no longer have the acceleration that Newton and Einstein predicted with their equations, and that's why neither one of those equations can predict why the pioneers are slowing down. They had to invent the nonsense absolute nonsense that these pros because of their irregular shapes they're throwing heat in front of them and that's what's slowing them down towards the sun but it turns out that the cassini probe uh the galileo probe they're all doing the same thing and they cannot they can't be that all of them have the same problem with heat in front of them this is any probe trying to leave the solar system because every atom of the probe is tied to the sun and because every atom of the sun is tied to every atom that makes Proxima Centauri, they would have to go from the bird's beak into the linear region and slow down. That's that's why the, the that would explain this inertial deal that this guy came up One with. One thing I found myself wondering today was, do you guys, you two, do you agree with uh, gravity being proportional in force to the square of the distance? Or do you think that becomes wrong at certain uh, scales? In the linear region, it's it's not true. So it's not even true when we're close that it's R squared? It's, it's close to the sun. It's very uh, Yeah, it, it is R squared. In, in our region, we have R squared. No problem. It's but not do you think R that when we get R away, R the, does it get closer to R or closer to R3? In other words, uh, gravity, the, the force of gravity seems to diminish as you get distant from the object. Is that diminishment a square function purely and forever up to the end of the universe? Or do you think that there, that it's not square? Only in the bird's beak. Only in the bird's beak. Only in the bird's beak do we have Newtonian gravity and Einstein gravity. When you get into the linear region, we no longer have Newtonian or Einsteinian gravity. It can't be. All right. Wonderful. Well, Was there any... Uh, Peter, go ahead. I guess to, to besides... Uh, uh, um, this is uh, too high IQ for me to uh, interpret in terms of bird beaks, but if we put that to the side... Uh, <laughs> You to answer your question, JF, uh, your your chart, your your the linear your your model, your your question about is it goes more than one over r squared at larger distances. I guess you were alluding to something like why we observe black uh, black uh, dark dark is a uh, alternative to dark matter interpretations. Why uh, the the force goes uh, differently? I'm not quite sure why you have this thought in the first place. 
that I don't know. I, I guess it emerged me. when I was looking at these YouTube videos about uh, dark matter precisely. Right. And they were like, th there, there was some missing uh, gravity. And, and I was wondering, what do we know about how the, the force of gravity diminishes with distance? I do know that this it's been uh, a, the alternate gravity only where the gravitational force uh, alters at different distances. Like it's a, it's a sort of a, a scalable parameter it has been played with in the past. I don't know exact. It's not my expertise to know exactly why, but for the most, the, at least the community uh, doesn't, uh, 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 doesn't think that is a valid, uh, uh, that for some reason doesn't work. Um, interpret that as you may. All right, wonderful. Was there anything else you guys wanted to discuss tonight? Because I have it, the clue to spectacle. I have a last reveal that I want to do to trigger Bill. I think that by showing him this image, he will go absolutely insane. <laughs> well, I, I, I do want to get to that uh, now, but uh, that's exciting to me. But uh, do, do, JF, do we have uh, time to look at uh, some of the uh, things that I sent to you? Or? Absolutely. Uh, let, let's look into it. Uh, did I forget to download them? You send them to me. I sent you links, hyperlinks. So th I don't think they should be. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. I remember I loaded them. There, here they are. So what did you want to look at first? So let's take a look at, for example, uh, my comment about the uh, 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 black holes. My, 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 uh, my one the criticism meme? about the meme. Sure. All right. Here uh, it is. So, so, so here we have saying uh, until we can feasibly probe black holes at the length and time scales of their dynamic behavior, they remain a topic of mathematical speculation. That is your statement. Yes, and this is a small brain interpretation. Yes, <laughs> and then there's this free uh, Freeman Dyson who comments on uh, uh, both uh, uh, Feynman and uh, not Feynman, sorry, uh, Einstein, and I think it's. Oppenheimer on the interpretation of black holes, uh, where he's, he is, says that they were not particularly interested in, but they said it's a thing of uh, mathematical beauty. Now we have Bill Gates uh, Gate here who ridicules mathematical physics, but for some reason he proceeds to develop a theory of uh, uh, that describes what is the pinnacle of mathematical physics. This is a, a, a circle that I quite haven't quite figured out how to square yet. <laughs> it's true, Bill. You are invoking mathematical concepts intuitively by referring to the, ro the, the rope, the pull, the push. Well, uh, let's put it in the proper context. The context is as follows. Mathematics describes, mathematics has no power to explain anything, any phenomenon. That's the first thing we have to get clear. An equation can only describe. The physical interpretation is the big problem today. We're not, con we're not contesting, we're not challenging the mathematics. We're saying we need to have a physical interpretation for how a, a, a pen falls to the floor. We need to have a physical interpretation how a magnet attracts another. We don't have these today. So, so the right. issue is not to continue developing more math. The issue is we, we need to figure out what the mechanism that Mother Nature uses to produce these effects. That's what we're. That's what I'm looking at. I'm saying we need we need to conceptualize these things. We don't need to observe right. anything. We don't need to measure anything. We don't need to do any more of that. What we need to do is conceptualize and say, how does Mother Nature perform all these things? And if we're going to say mass pulls, you know, the mass of a black hole pulls on a star, we're using magic. We're not explaining it. We're just saying, look, there's this, when, when the elephant is very big, it pulls stronger. That's all we're saying when, when we say mass. We need to have a physical mechanism. It's got to be an elongated mechan uh, mediator. It cannot be anything other than an elongated mediator. Now, And a rope is a good mediator. Now, Bill, uh, I... I, I actually do, as I mentioned last time, I do, do agree that a physical, a real interpretation, I would say, uh, of what's going on, of, of the dynamics of what's going on in these circumstances work. So now, if, JF, if you could pull up the, uh, the actually just the one uh, 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 might be good enough for, to, uh, for today. The, yep, there we go. So this is 
uh, a, a real interpretation that uh, has been uh, we've been play uh, that has been done over in a few uh, labs, uh, including uh, Bush's lab in, at MIT. So if you want to go ahead and uh, uh, play that from the beginning. All right, here it is. So now we have these bouncing balls here, or bouncing oil droplets that you can interpret as, say, your charged particles bouncing wow. on your fabric. And that's you oil see, bouncing on water? It's oil, it's oil droplets bouncing on oil on a vibrating disc. Wow. And these are, these this has actually been performed in the lab so this is quite amazing and they the 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 that's a fast scan of of a uh, 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 a uh, a much faster speed bouncing of these uh of these dro uh, oil droplets that you see here and the 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 key mechanism is that these these oil droplets uh when they bounce they produce the waves and there you have entangled particles for example but the key mechanism is the 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 ball bounces uh, here's the mechanism. If you want to pause it for a second, um, the key uh, mechanism is that the 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 oil droplet uh, uh, disturbs the the water uh, the oil around it and produces a a, a a vibration or a wave in the in the shaker in in the in the in the liquid and then as a result the uh, the when it uh, comes up and then bounces down again it's going to move in a particular direction depending on uh, where it lands with respect to the waves that it already created. This is fascinating. But th this is what is this meant as a model of what happens in quantum physics while it doesn't happen with oil? Right. This is a exactly. So, what is the oil supposed to be an analogy of? The oil. Uh, the ocean. The ocean. The ocean is is interpreted to be the. The potential, the uh, the electromagnetic potential that uh, uh, physical objects. Tell me, uh, speak objects. Don't tell voltage. me no, the, the, oh, I'm not. I'm sorry. Can you repeat that? Uh, this doesn't yeah, make sense. I don't want you using any word of mathematics. I want you to use physical object. What is the oil an analogy of? What is the, the photons oil in terms of of the medium? Uh, the photons. Huh? Photons. No, 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 no. We, we still don't. We're still not talking in the same. Uh, see the you're, saying that you're saying there's this ball that's going up and down, right? This right. oil droplet, droplet. Right? And it's going up and down in some kind of ocean. There, you show an ocean, ocean of photons. I'm sorry. A ocean of photons. Ocean of photons. Okay, so that means all these photons are discrete particles. Am I right here? They can be, it can be an they elongated. Are, they are, it's a yes or no. <laughs> it, <laughs> I mean, I you want you want to get more granular. We don't need to get, we don't need to get granular here, Bill, but. Uh, well, I, do, I do want to get, I want to get to the bottom of it. I want to know okay. if all that ocean, that ocean of oil, are those discrete <laughs> particles or are they interconnected? That's what I want to know. Are they What's interconnected? The photon particle. What is the. The medium that surrounds the photon particles, each each photon. What it what is it surrounded by? Each each photon particle. No, the electrons are the oil droplets that are bouncing. Yeah, and and the and the ocean. I, I'm concerned about the ocean. Forget about the oil part. I, I want to yeah. I want to look at this ocean, this magical ocean that you have there. <laughs> it's magical, Bill. I can go to the hardware store. Bill, I can go to the hardware store and get uh, oil here. I'm not sure what the you know, the problem well, here is. It's magical critical. when applied to quantum. It's magical when we say there's an ocean around an atom or whatever. What is the medium that keeps an electron tied to a, a proton? That's what I'm looking at. I'm looking at this field, so, thing, this, this 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 magical word word that is used in quantum mechanics. This field, this this region in where everything floats. Bill, this is a real this that was a real experiment that was performed. Uh, again, if we can get back to it. I have no problem with the experiment. I want to know <laughs> how you apply this analogy to quantum. That's what I want you to tell me. So what is the, the ocean? The, ocean. the wave is the electromagnetic potential. 
Uh, there's no such word as potential in science. So that's a okay. So what would you like? What would you like to? What would? What, I want so, a physical. I want a tree. I want a rock. I want a a dog. I want a physical object. Then, it, then, if you, if you, if you, if you want, then we can call it the 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 liquid. The fabric. The fabric. The liquid or the fabric. <laughs> yeah, but the liquid, liquid. There, you have a two dimensional. You have this ball floating in in a two dimensional scenario. Sure. Here we know that we know that uh, you know the the region around an atom has to be three dimensional. Well, I mean, on the surface of a of uh, yeah, a metal, sure, for example, yeah. you have, for example, uh, uh, charged particles moving around the surface, and you have surface charges. So, I mean, it's not we're not only can always confined to three dimensions. That's the first thing I should mention. Now, is there three I, dimensions around an atom? I know you don't like to abstract, Bill. No, no, it's but, not a question of abstract. I need to conceptualize this. Conceptualize. I need to, find out, I need to find out. I need to find out if I have an atom, the region around it has to be three dimension. Right. Okay, so now how do you put your two-dimensional surface onto this three-dimensional scenario? That's what I want you to conceptualize for me. This is a difficult thing to do. Uh, it's I, it's I was, not I was, impossible. It's not you're impossible. You're talking about land, and I'm talking about solid land. <laughs> so, Bill, in other words, you're saying that Peter, uh, with his oil, is a good performance artist. But not a physicist. <laughs> I have no, I have no problem with the experiment that he did. No problem whatsoever. I'm just saying we cannot well, I didn't do it, but... analogy what happens around an atom, or, or we cannot say that this oil, which is a two dimensional scenario, is what the ether in the universe is made of, or the ether around an atom, or whatever. The world is three dimensional. We have to have. We have to identify what physical objects are in that invisible three-dimensional world. This two-dimensional scenario cannot be extrapolated to our three-dimensional world. Otherwise, you got to identify that three-dimensional ocean. The, pro the problem, Bill, is that with the oil droplet experiment, we're utilizing uh, gravity in a unique way. The, uh, the reason why it doesn't, uh, uh, it doesn't work is not because uh, of some... Uh, missing link in our uh, system, but, be, but precisely because we don't have uh, gravity, say, for example, uh, working in this way. Now, if we had, uh, for example, we used some sort of charged fluid, for example, and we uh -huh. use some sort of background charge, for example, uh, that that would it would probably be probably crazy voltages that you need to apply inside this uh, three-dimensional uh, C. And you uh, say charged the sides and then shaked these uh, uh, vibrated the created noise uh, that uh, created this sort of uh, uh, wave around it. Uh, I might imagine that you could or a bubble of waves around it. Uh, I'm not. It doesn't. It doesn't seem far fetched to be able to extend this uh, analogy with a uh, within a, a physical setup. I just wanted to point this out in that uh, it's very neat what uh, Bill's uh, developed. Uh, uh, I just want to point out that it's actually, this is how I, instead of uh, uh, comparing it to the uh, wave particle, uh, waves and particles, I think build ropes are much more suited to, say, be compared to oil and bound, uh, oil droplets in terms of uh, uh, where it lies in the realm of uh, physics. All right. I'm, so, yeah, I, I'm curious what you think about that, JF. Well, uh, I mean, I, I cannot take a conclusion on this freaking case. That's why I keep having Bill on. I, I, there seems to be nothing that will stop Bill. <laughs> he, he can adjust his explanation to everything. And now he, he's asking me to leave dark matter and, and marry the, the rope. It's a tough decision. I'm very emotional with these things. I would say I've never seen any sort of alternative thinking framework that that is so uh malleable to the point of explaining everything and potentially more than current physics so that's why i keep having bail on it's just it's stunning and in any case even if it was wrong it is good thinking that helps the mind to 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 try bold ideas and that's what we need in physics anyway Precisely, right. I do agree with you. I do agree with you there, JF. I, this is uh, one. Uh, uh, I think we more people should uh, explore these. I would say heterodox ideas. Uh, these different 
what I would call different uh, ways of philosophically approaching science as opposed to the, uh, the, the orthodox pedagogy. Uh, I think only then can one advance uh, 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 and try to understand uh, more about the reality we live in. All right. Uh, now, AF, uh, yes. I'd like to answer that fellow who, who asked that question earlier. Oh, yes. Let I, me reread the question here. I don't want to leave them dangling. So Fizzes was asking, what substance are ropes made of and how can okay. you prove it and observe it? Don't try to deflect the question with bullshit about how you don't need to prove it. <laughs> well, uh, first of all, let, let me address that last part first. In science, we don't prove. Prove means I'm going <laughs> to twist your arm and convince you and try to make you believe like I do. So we don't do that in science. Science, we explain for you to understand, and then we leave it at that. What you believe is your own personal business. So there's no proof. And I'm not going to prove to him anything. What I'm going to do is the following. I'm going to explain to him what the model is. The model is that a rope is really, if, if we were to untangle every atom, every rope in the universe, we would have a single closed loop thread. Okay. So I'm saying the entire matter in the universe consists of one single closed loop thread. Think of it as a circle. Okay. That's the best probably image. Okay. That you have. okay so there's ultimately that's all there is in the universe. Now this, this thread winds around, turns into atoms and ropes that interconnect the atoms. That's it. That's all that is in matter. So if we were to unravel every atom, every rope, all we would have in the entire universe is one thread. The thread is an elementary entity, an elementary entity by definition, by definition, or fundamental entity, is one which is not made of any constituent parts. It's a single closed loop thread that's made of a single piece, but it has uh, the ability to be flexible, unlike what we have in our macro world, where we say, well, if something is made of a single piece, it's not flexible, it's not malleable. This thread is made of a single uh, piece, and therefore it's not made of anything itself, because by uh, definition or, or the assumption is that uh, this thread makes up everything else. Okay, so that's the answer to his question. Hey Bill, uh, one thing that we didn't get to—I didn't get to clarify uh, last. Perhaps you already did clarify. When you have, say, four uh, uh, particle uh, particles here, uh, yeah. so when you have rope uh, interacting with all of them, and let's yeah. say I—and this is the in, uh, polarization problem that I didn't quite understand. If I start rotating, say, two of these particles uh, yeah. with respect to each other, do you yeah. predict that when there's going to be a tangling, a tangling of these ropes? I don't do predictions. Sorry. No, I'm not asking you. Can you please well, describe what happens? When one, no, no. When when two particles, when two particles over here are rotating, yeah, are rotating with respect to there, and there is another pair over there where there yeah. is ropes connected. They're going yeah. to get. They're going to get tangled up. Aha! Tangling. You, you want to? Uh, you want an answer? You, tangling. I want an answer into tangling, Bill, because. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Of course. Now, the first question I've got, because, you know, everybody, of course, thinks of the tangling issue. Oh, all these ropes out there, don't they tangle? And, and the first answer to that is, well, did, why didn't you ask the question in quantum? Quantum has the idiocy of a particle being at two places at once. It's known as decoherence. Wow. Hold it, hold it. And then it also has where a, two particles can be at the same place. It's called superposition. Nobody questions that. Well, well, Bill, I, I would say this: the wave. Uh, if you go back to the interpret the the picture that I, I I showed before, where you have a bouncing oil droplet, where you yeah. have uh, uh, you have the uh, you ha if you notice the wave is actually dispersed uh, 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 long in further distance than where the oil droplet itself is. As a result, the yeah. uh, it can be in two. It can go through the wave itself can go through both slits. To take the analogy further. However, the oil droplet only goes through one, and the 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 the, the result of the wave going through allows the uh, the gives a uh, additional possibilities of the uh, of where the the oil drop oil droplet can bounce. 
So I don't see I don't see a contradiction if you use that. Well, the contradiction is that you use the magic wand. That's where the contradiction. Wand, is. Which is, where's the wand? The wand is that you turn your particle, your discrete particle, into a wave to get nope. your there, your case done. It's there's no there magic no there. Major particles. Can a particle be at two places at once? That's the question. Particle. The part we we describe the particle as the wave as the wave combined with the the, the well, water wave combined <laughs> combined with what what people ordinary describe as particle wave duality as is the particle yeah, with the wave it's cheating it's known as cheating not, fine but if you want to use and if you if you want to use a language interpretive uh, interpreted using what's called pilot wave theory which is what i was presenting here uh, uh, and that was a particular uh, formulation. Uh, the oil droplet is a physical analogy of it. You have a you have a uh, have a particle uh, in a real physical uh, mediated uh, wave, and the the oil the uh, the particle is just in one spot, but the wave can be in multiple positions. All right, I know that's what the, what quantum did. They brought in duality. They said, look. Let's just merge the I'm particle and the wave. And when, when we got to explain this, we'll use the particle. And when we want to explain that, we'll just use the wave. And that's the problem. That's cheating. It's known as cheating because you don't have a physical interpretation if you're going to use the particle as a wave whenever, you know, it's convenient. That's ad hoc. Well, well Bill, I, I hope uh, maybe uh, take a look at that, uh, uh, the, the oil droplet uh, uh, analogy uh, further. And then maybe you can... Uh, 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 comment more on this later. I didn't want to throw. I didn't mean to to throw this at you. I think uh, there's more no, to I, it than I, you're I, you're you're appreciating. I looked I looked at it uh, this afternoon, and uh, again, uh, my only question with that uh, right off the top the three of my dimension head was that you know you got to uh, interpret you got to show what the analogy is of that two dimensional up and down surface to a three dimensional you know solid land. What I call. <laughs> Yes, but I would say it does solve the problem that you might have with particle wave duality. Uh, to solve that problem, we need to start at language semantics. That's where we have to start. Semantics, yes, which is the philosophical which, which, which I which I the words mean. I didn't I didn't mean to uh, belittle that last time. This is a, it's an important uh, it's an important topic, but uh, it, 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 it it's more it's not physics. It it is. I would say a a difficult it's a difficult portion of philosophy and metaphysics of the physics we're describing. I disagree. I'm saying we have to establish the foundations of physics. No one has done that in ten thousand years. Nobody knows what physics is about. That's the problem. You're that is true. Objects. You're mixing. Has to do with uh, you. You can't do physics without objects. Therefore, you need to define for the discipline known as physics. You need to define what an object is and separate it from concepts. And mathematics, yeah. and physics only works with concepts: positive, negative, wave. All that is nonsense. That has no mass. You know, none of that has anything to do with physics. Physics only works with objects. To and to that. I would say that you're right in that we do need to deal with objects. It, there are difficulties in that we have we've tried to measure, say, the sh the size of the electron, and we still haven't figured out what the size is. I know you have an answer to that, uh, which is actually a pretty clever one, which is, uh, is why I like the whole hypothesis for that reason. One one of the many reasons, but I would say you are mixing metaphysics with physics. This is what I would uh, how I would answer that. Uh, it's like don't you need foundations for physics yes or no it's like it's like yes you do need foundations but it was not but it i, I would it but yes yeah you're absolutely right but other pe people are going to have different metaphysics uh because physics cannot answer questions about metaphysics is what i'm going to say <laughs> people, so don't me please please stop mixing it's just like you're mixing uh a biology with a biologicalism in a sense sort of the mesophysics of biology uh, uh let's let's you want to include both but uh, let's not mix the, the two up and say they're the same thing i'm not saying that we mix them i'm saying that for per, for um the way math um, physics has developed it developed along mathematics and today we have this erroneous view of physics that it's about mathematics it's not 
Physics right. is about objects. And so we have sure. to establish what physics is about. And that's got nothing to do with metaphysics or philosophy. It's got to do with establishing the foundations of physics. Right. Until and we find out that. No, I agree. I agree with you there. You know, yeah, the reason I'm it. very welcoming of Bill's view here is that I, I agree that uh, that essentially a science needs to define what's the subject and it cannot define two subjects. It must start with one thing that it studies. And, and I fully agree that in physics, it's not really specified. I've ev never heard it specified by anyone else than Bill himself. Now, Bill, I was wondering, it passed through my head. What do you think when Lawrence Krauss says something from nothing? <laughs> <laughs> well, again, that's magic. That's uh, you. You gave a good example. I mean, is that physics, or, or are we talking religion now? Well, you know, I mean, what is that? Well, I mean, I you should you should keep in mind, Bill, that uh, uh, you you may, you you treat physics as if it's some sort of uniform block. Most people, uh, most physicists, actually are quite critical of uh, of uh, Lawrence Krauss's uh, liberal uh, use of the word nothing. I don't think that's true, uh, Peter. I'm going to be honest with you. I, I, think have, the majority I have experience to say uh, suggest otherwise. Okay, maybe you do because you're closer to those people. I'm not going to dispute that. I have a different opinion. Let me tell you why. What reaches the public, that's what I'm concerned about. I don't wow. care what the people, I don't care what the Harvard people think or the Cambridge people think. I want to know what the public thinks. And the public at large believes black holes as being true and proven and, and no chance of ever turning that back. They believe in dark matter. It's presented as proof and truth to them. So the public believes in all these things. And that's what I'm concerned about. If, if, you, if, if the mathematician would present it to the public saying, look, this is speculative, we don't really know, but that's not the way they present it. They say, we've proven black hole, we've seen them, we know they collided and sent gravity. They talk about it as proof and truth, and that's what the public believes. That's the it, problem. I, I completely agree with you here, Bill. Uh, it's kind of a problem of the squeakiest wheel gets the oil, and uh, the squeaky wheels in these scenarios uh, are a abusing language, and they are abusing concepts, and I, I completely agree with you there. All right, gentlemen, we are headed toward our conclusion. I will pull my last move on Bill, and I will be singing a song from Rage Against the Machine. And uh, and who was it before Rage Against the Machine? I don't even remember. I will be dancing on the grave of the rope theory because I'm about to present a graph that will trigger Bill Gade. One, two, three, go. Here is something you can't understand. Here is something you can't understand. I can get a X boson. Here is something you can't understand, Bill. I can get a X boson. Here is something you can't understand. What do you have to say to this graph, Bill? Love it. You, uh, how much does it cost to buy your long play? <laughs> 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 All right, gentlemen, it was a pleasure. I'll be continuing the show alone. I have some news hey, to cover. Thank you so much for coming. Peter? Hey, if there's just one thing I, I would like to say at the end is uh, uh, I hope uh, that uh, 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 we uh, continue to put aside uh, uh, petty human squabbles uh, that we get involved with on a daily basis. Uh, and I hope that tonight's discussion uh, helped us illuminate the truth about a reality that we can pass on to our future uh, AI or overlords, as predicted by JF's new book, uh, the, the Revolutionary Phenotype, uh, available on Amazon.com nearest you. <laughs> thank you so much. Bill, thank you for coming. Bye-bye. Yeah, bye-bye. <laughs> All right. That was uh, exciting. Again, these discussions are so fascinating. What is there to say after this? Erdar Brenner says rope. And he says that feel when I'm smarter than these scientists. Arnold Nikatina says this has completely turned me off of pursuing any education in physics. Jeff, I understand now why you no longer work in the science industry. But I think that these discussions are fascinating. Uh, when we test these, uh, these frameworks, uh, personally, it's not the kind of discussion that got me out of academia. It's precisely the contrary. It is the assumption that something is wrong without proper challenge. 
That is what hurts me. Hurts what I think, and Stan Bucks, he says, these shows are so much fun. Machiavelliscus says, did Einstein prove time travel is possible? Well, in a sense, yes, you can, you can view dilation of time as, um, you can view dilation of time as a, an effect of, uh, a, a time of, a type of time travel. But it's just a type and it's just, it just gets you into the future with respect to other people who don't travel as fast as you. Uh, Francis Varnick says, Bill, how do you explain heat mechanistically? Uh, I think that Bill has, th the reason I didn't take the time to ask is that it was already getting long and Bill has a, a traditional view of heat. In other words, his rope theory doesn't say anything special about heat as far as I know. You can, uh, you can have, uh, you can have his robes just shaking, ju just having energy. Uh, well, well, it's true that he probably wouldn't use the word energy. So maybe I can ask him next time. Farm Master Ferrer says, thoughts on theoretically using general relativity to travel forward in time, such as a particle moving at a fraction of light speed to dilate time. Yeah, it, it is, uh, it must exist. But the question is, how much energy do we, can we uh, use to get there? And the, the big problem is also the effect of accelerational effects of gravity. Uh, getting to the speed of light, you, you will need to undergo um, 6G, 7G type of acceleration for a long, long time. Maybe with a frozen body it would work, but the faster you get to the speed of light, the more you have difficulties uh, because it crushes your body and you cannot handle uh, more than 1G in a prolonged fashion, maybe 2G in extreme cases, but you'll need to be frozen if you go for 3, 4, 5G. Uh, 